and welcome back to my channel where I'm going to cover the Rangers Monster Slayer class specialization from Xanathar's Guide to Everything, providing a brief description of the subclass as well as explain and set up the various features gained. A Monster Slayer is just what you might be thinking the class is. They are trained to handle creatures others might shy away from. Rangers of this class specialization have honed their abilities to better fight the most dangerous of foes, and in some cases remove the advantages those foes have over a typical character. They are designed to hit hard, hit fast, and take out their targets as fast as they possibly can. And as a result of this, it is one of the few classes outside of the monk class that can stack abilities to best suit the needs of the moment. Now rangers choose their class specialization at level 3, so you will have time to consider what subclass you wish to take before you get to level 3. But you will want to pay attention to those class specializations because some of them can have different stat requirements like we have found with some other classes. However, let's go ahead and level up our ranger here and choose the Monster Slayer class specialization. Once again, the first features rangers of this class will gain is called Monster Slayer Magic, and it grants your character spells they would normally not have access to in order to counter the abilities of their foes. Your character will initially gain access to the protection from evil and good spell, but will gain additional spells at levels 5, 9, 13, and 17. These spells will always be accessible to your character as long as they have a free spell slot and will not count against the total number of prepared spells that your character would normally be able to learn. So let's quickly go ahead and set up our first spell in our character's action sheet. And I'm going to drop this initially into the spells grouping here. And the reason why I'm going to do that is because it would have automatically dropped there anyway. So the first thing I want to do is I want to make a minor adjustment to this. I want to call this Monster Slayer Magic or Monster Slayer Spells for the actual power group. And this power group will then need to be converted into a spell group in order for it to function the way that we want it to. We also want to set up the base stat to be wisdom for all of these particular settings here. And that will just give us the ability to make sure that our ranger stats are used for all of these spells. Now with this set up, we've essentially set up the groundwork that we're going to be able to take advantage of down the road when we add the additional spells to our character sheet. Because this is going to be a linked spell group and I will showcase that once we actually add in our 5th level spell here. Also at Ranger level 3, your character will gain access to the Hunter's Sense feature that allows your character to study a creature they are engaged with and learn several things about that creature. As long as your character uses an action to do nothing more than study a given creature, and as long as that creature is within 60 feet of your character, you will learn what that creature's vulnerabilities, immunities, or resistances are to a given damage type. However, this only applies to creatures who have no method of hiding themselves from divination or are currently not being shielded by such a spell. You will have a limited number of uses equal to your character's wisdom modifier before they will need to complete a long rest in order to regain any spent uses. So let's quickly go ahead and add this to our character's actions tab. This is going to be under the Monster Slayer power group because it is directly associated with our class specialization. The only thing we have to do is prepare it in the sense of set up its number of uses, and that's going to be equal to your character's wisdom modifier, which in the case of this character's example here, we have plus three. So that means we have three uses. So I'm going to go ahead and set three daily uses of that particular feature. To showcase how this feature is going to work, I've gone ahead and created a combat scenario here, and also set up our ranger with the action token. What's going to happen is, is that as this ranger decides to use this feature, let's say they're going to use it on the white dragon because I know they have an immunity that your character can learn. So they're going to target the actual adult dragon here and tell the DM, I'm going to spend this turn using Hunter Sense to study this creature. What's going to then happen is as you, oh, apparently that dragon is still in the process of recovering their breath weapon. As your character studies that particular creature, they're going to monitor the combat or any other aspect of this particular creature throughout the rest of the combat scenario. And when it comes back around to the point of the ranger's turn again, what's going to happen is that the dungeon master is now going to say, the adult white dragon has an immunity to cold damage. You've now learned its immunity. And you've also learned what type it is. And then you can do that with an adult white dragon because they are not protected by any way, shape, or form from anything that we're would protect them from scrying or from any form of divination. Now, you as a player might know that a white dragon is not necessarily protected from divination. However, your character is not going to know that. So you're going to have to play this as if your character is not aware. For example, let's say that the vampire 
has a natural immunity to divination. They don't, but let's say that they do. And your character to chooses to go through and actually, quote-unquote, use hunter sense on the vampire. Well, what's going to happen there is the dungeon master is going to say you detect no vulnerabilities, immunities, or resistances. Despite the fact that their protection from divination is simply blocking your ability from being able to see it. And because a vampire is in fact resistant to necrotic, bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage, then you're now in a situation where you have a problem. Because as far as you are aware, there are no resistances in relation to that vampire. But in fact, it was going to be the divination aspect of it, or the fact that they're hidden from div divination, that prevented you from learning that ability. The final feature your character will gain at level 3 is called a Slayer's Prey. And it allows your character to use the heat of combat to increase your anger over a given creature or target and mark that particular creature in such a way that you gain a means to do additional damage to it. This is a bonus action, and the target in question must be within 60 feet of your character for the effect to work. But as long as those conditions are met, and it's a creature you've chosen to mark in this way, when you first hit that creature, they will take an extra 1d6 points of damage from your weapon your character just used, be that a ranged or melee based weapon, as well as unarmed strikes if your character was disarmed. Any subsequent strikes that hit during that same time will not be able to gain this damage benefit, but it will become available again on the next turn, and that will remain a capability until your character completes a short or long rest. Now I admit I don't like the wording of the last two sentences on the information sheet as it is a bit confusing, but the way I read it is as follows. As long as your character does not complete a short or a long rest and the creature you targeted managed to get away and is still at large, then the effect is still in place and it only goes away once that rest happens or you move the effect to another creature. However, if the creature is killed off or you have chosen to designate another target as your character's prey, then the effect drops on the first target and it moves to the second target, essentially giving you the means to shift this around, much like the Warlock's Hex feature. But you don't lose the ability of making use of this again until the next fight. The first thing we're going to want to do is add this to our character's action sheet. And we're going to copy that particular power group into place and make sure it's sorted. And we already have the 1d6 damage roll here. But the reason why I have an issue with this is as follows. The benefits last until you finish a short or a long rest. That means that in theory, you need to be able to move this particular benefit around until you've completed that shorter or long rest. So normally you would go through and set up a once rest period here so that when you actually go through and use it, you tick it and away it goes. Well, here's the problem. It's kind of backwards in the sense that the effect sticks around until you actually complete a rest, not the other way around in the sense that when you burn through this, you've used up a slot. And I know I stated earlier that in theory, the effects of this would go away on your next combat encounter. There's actually debate going on right now about whether that is in fact the case. And in a lot of cases, DMs are ruling that this effect is there until you've completed a long rest. So once you've activated the feature, you can use it in every subsequent fight that you have throughout the course of the day. Obviously, as a player, I kind of like the ability to use it at will. However, as a dungeon master, I think it might be a little bit overpowered. But that's kind of the point of this class. They're supposed to be overpowered. And I have a minor improvement that I like to make. Because of the ambiguity around how frequently you can use this feature, I get rid of the preparation and just leave it as it normally is. I also go through and add a new effect here that's going to set up what's called a marker. And that marker in this case is going to be called Slayer's Prey. Now, I'm not putting an expiration on the rounds or the rolls because the idea is it should stick around until that particular target is dead or the target has moved out of your reach and you're no longer engaged with them. Although, with a longbow and sharpshooter skills, technically that reach is quite a ways out. <laughs> now, the next thing I want to do is make an adjustment to this particular effect. And the reason why I want to do that is I want it to take advantage of that particular marker. So I'm going to call this Slayer's Prey. I'm going to copy that because I will need that in a moment. This is going to be a semicolon, and I'm going to go IFT colon custom, and in brackets, put our Slayer's Prey reference there, and then I'm going to put a semicolon here. And what that's going to do is enable things to oh, custom, that's an O there, enable things to go through 
and only trigger this extra damage if it's on a marked target. So if you switch targets quickly to assist, say, one of your party members, you won't do that additional damage to that particular character or creature. I'm going to leave no duration here as well as leave the on next roll set. And the reason why I'm doing that is because I still want this to go away after the next roll because the subsequent attacks that you might do against that same creature shouldn't gain this bonus. So here's how this is going to work. Let's say during combat, I'm going to go ahead and tag this adult white dragon as my slayer's prey. I'm going to apply the effect to that particular dragon, and then I'm going to make my initial attack roll. Let's say, let's just make a bow attack here. And that is going to be a miss. So I'm going to go ahead and make another attack because this character at this level doesn't necessarily have an extra attack, but I wanted to showcase what happens during a hit. So we now have the extra damage that we need to apply to that particular target. So I'm going to go ahead and apply this effect here to our own character, and you can see that that gets added here. I am then going to roll the damage for the bow. Now there's a few extra dice here because of the fact that it was a critical hit. But if you subtract the extra damage, you'll see that there are, is a 1d8 and a 1d6 that is rolled. The 1d8 is from our bow. The 1d6 is from our Slayer's Prey, and the effect has gone away from our character. So if we had an extra attack, we could go and make another attack and not worry about that bonus applying. This is a great setup for that, and it will only become tricky if you happen to have multiple rangers of this particular class specialization inside of the same party, which right now I do, actually. <laughs> and the way that would be fixed is you simply adjust the effect marker here to be Slayer's Prey and then your character's name, and then do the same thing inside of this custom bracket here so that they match, and that way it's unique to your character, and you don't have to worry about a conflict coming into play. Now let's say the adult white dragon has died. Well, what I would then do is I would remove the effect from that white dragon, and I can now designate, for example, the vampire as my next target. So I'm just going to quickly unselect that dragon and target the vampire. Now that vampire is my slayer's prey. So the next time I do my first attack against that particular creature, let's showcase that now, so that's going to be a hit. Before I roll my damage, I apply this effect and then I roll my damage. Now, the vampire is going to partially resist that because they have that ability. But you can see how this works. Now, this is where it gets a little bit tricky. Let's say that this particular combat scenario is now over, and you're now two hours, three hours later into another combat scenario. In theory, if the DM has allowed it, this feature would still be in play. You haven't rested yet, but the benefits are still there. That's specifically how they explain how this feature works. So you could theoretically target your next creature with this particular ability and gain the benefits during that particular combat encounter. When you go through and complete your rest, that's when you have to actually initiate another use of Slayer's Prey, which it's kind of confusing that way, and I would not be surprised if a DM states, once that combat encounter is over, that's it, you can't use that ability again until you get to a short or long rest situation. Then you can use it on your next combat scenario. It's going to be entirely up to the DM. At Ranger level 5, our character is now going to gain access to their next spell. So in this case, it's Zone of Truth. I'm going to drag and drop that into place, and you'll notice that it created a new power group. And this is important, because if we've officially burned through all of our particular spells for a particular level, these should go away. But you'll notice they didn't. That's because I'm in Standard. The you'll see that they have now gone away. <laughs> and that is because we want that to. Anything that is showing up as a second level spell or lower will reappear, but anything that is first level or lower will disappear. So I can better showcase this if I use up all my second level spells. You'll see that all second level spells have gone away, and the only ones that have stuck around are the first level spells. That's how we want that to work. Now, you'll notice that these particular spells are not prepared as we have done in previous videos, yet they still show up. As I said, there are some spells that will be available in a combat-based mode, even though they're not prepared. In this particular case, I'm going to go ahead and prepare them just for the purposes of being complete. 
Now, I'd also indicated earlier that these two spell groups are linked. And in fact, any spell that we drop into this particular group or even this particular group will create additional groups if there's an increase in the level of that particular spell. And they will all become linked to one another such that if I make an adjustment here, so let's say I switch this to strength, you will see that this also adjusts to strength. And if I make the adjustment here to put it back to wisdom, you will see that when I click on this, it will be back at wisdom. So this just goes to show that these two are actually linked. And any other spell that we drop in here that triggers an additional spell group to be created, that group will also be linked to these groups. So we only have to make the adjustment once for it to affect all of the groups associated with that particular set of spells. At Ranger level 7, your character will gain access to the Supernatural Defense feature that gives your character an extra 1d6 roll that you can add to a saving throw or to a roll being made to escape a grapple from a given creature. In order for you to gain this benefit, the creature who is attacking you or has you in a grapple must be the creature that you have marked with Slayer's Prey. And now you can see why I've added that marker because it's now going to get used in this feature as well. So the very first thing I'm going to do is ensure that this is added to our class specialization power group and that there is a new effect into place. And we're only going to be able to modify it in a way that gives us a partial coverage of this particular feature. And that's this. Supernatural defense, semicolon, IFT, colon, custom, and in brackets, slayer's prey, save 1d6. And there's a semicolon and after prey and there or after the bracket after prey and there is a colon after save. So the way that this is going to work is as follows. I've already loaded the effect onto our character and let's say that this vampire is going to trigger our character to execute a saving throw. You'll notice one thing. We've rolled our usual 1d20 there but we also had our 1d6 roll and that's because Fantasy Grounds is able to check who our current target is, and if they are the incoming attacker, ensure that the marker matches, and away we go. The effect works. If the adult white dragon had the action token and triggered a saving throw, it doesn't go through and make that roll. I don't know if this is new to Fantasy Grounds Unity or if it existed with Fantasy Grounds Classic, but I honestly don't recall this feature working in past videos that I tried to, to go through and set this up on, so I'm wondering if it's new. If not, then I was just doing it wrong in the first place. <laughs> now, the second half of this, we're going to have to add another effect for, and there's not really much we can do about that in the sense of controlling where this particular effect comes into play. And what we want to do is call the supernatural defense as well, semicolon, and we want to call this check 1d6 strength. So anytime there's a strength check that is made, it will go through and roll a 1d6, and it's going, oops, it will expire on the next roll. There we go, and it will be on yourself. And you may have noticed that I didn't remove that from our particular character, and that's because it sticks around. It doesn't just go away. This one has to go away because of how we're going to have to make use of it. And here is why. Let's say that you are in the process of attempting to break out of a grapple. Well, the way that works is that both the creature that has you grappled and your own character individually roll strength checks, and whoever has the higher roll is going to win that contest. So if I have the vampire go ahead and roll a strength check here, Ugh, that's going to be bad for our character. But then I go ahead and have our character roll a strength check. The first thing I want to do is ensure that this 1d6 roll is on our character sheet there, the effect. Now when I make the roll, I'm now going to be able to add that 1d6 to our effect, and the effect goes away. This is perfect, because in this particular case, we are still grappled. But you want the effect to go away, because if later on the adult white dragon triggers some form of a check, we don't want that ability to be there, or that check to be there. And in this case, it's only going to be strength that's going to trigger it anyway. So at Ranger level 9, we are now going to gain our third spell from our Monster Slayer Magic spell list here. And minimize that. Drag and drop this into place. And now we have our spell group. And as I said earlier, all three of these spell groups are linked together. But I am going to make sure that this particular spell is once again prepared. 
in the event that it is one of those ones that needs to be prepared in order for it to show up under the combat sheet here. At Ranger level 11, your character will now gain the Magic User's Nemesis feature, and this gives your character the means to interrupt any spellcaster that is attempting to cast a spell or teleport that is within 60 feet of your character. By making use of a reaction, your character will cause them to make a wisdom-based saving throw against your character's own spell DC save. Otherwise, the spell or teleport will fail. However, Fantasy Grounds will automatically set that up for us once we create the effect. This feature has a single use before your character will be required to complete a short or a long rest in order to regain that spent use. So let's go ahead and drop this into our character sheet here. I'm going to minimize our spell ones here. Expand out our oops, Monster Slayer group. Drop that into place and make sure that I copy and paste the group into place. Now the good news for us is that the saving throw is already there. Its value might be incorrect, so all you want to do is just pop open this magnifying glass to ensure that it gets corrected. Now that this is ready to go, let's go ahead and show you how this is going to get used. So I'm going to use a Mind Flayer in this particular case to trigger an example of how this scenario works. And that's because this is going to apply regardless of whether the creature is casting spells with psionics or whether they're doing it semantically, or even verbally for that matter. So let's say that the Mind Flayer is about to cast Dominate Monster. Well, the way this would work is as follows. You would simply select this saving throw dice here and drop it on top of the Mind Flayer. And that's going to trigger a saving throw for them. I don't know why it rolled twice. Do they have some form of weakness to that? I don't know. Ah, no, they have advantage on wisdom-based saving throws. So that's the reason why. In this particular case, they managed to succeed on their wisdom-based saving throw, which means they would still be able to finish the casting of that spell. However, let's see if we can trigger a failure. Well, they have to roll a 12 or lower on two pairs of dice. The odds of that are low. But anyway, let's say that this particular one was a failure. What would then happen is that the Mind Flayer would have their spell interrupted, they would not be able to complete that spell, and you would have burnt the use of a reaction, meaning you couldn't react further on in the combat scenario. Although, seeing as you're at the end of the combat turn anyway, not that big of a deal. But, as I said earlier, it doesn't matter whether it's a psionics-based spell, or whether it is something that is being verbally or semantically cast, you will be able to interrupt that spell. In addition to that, if someone is attempting to teleport out, the same thing happens. And in both cases, or in all cases, the effect, or the spell rather, I should say, is spent. Meaning that they had gone through the process of casting that spell, they have now burnt the use of that particular spell in the process, or in that particular teleport attempt. At Ranger level 13, your character is now gaining the Banishment spell. So I'm going to quickly drag and drop that into place. It will create our level 4 power group. The last thing we then have to do is just ensure that we enable... The preparation token here, or tag, to ensure that that spell is available to us, regardless of whether we're in a combat and actions mode or not. At Ranger level 15, your character is going to gain the Slayer's counter feature that gives your character the means to react against and potentially attack a creature marked with your Slayer's prey feature if they choose to force your character into making a saving throw. It does not matter what that saving throw is, be it from a spell or something physical. It only has to be that your character is being made to make a saving throw. And that the creature that is requiring that saving throw or forcing your character to make that saving throw has been marked with your Slayer's Prey marker. When this happens, your character can attack that creature. And if they hit that creature, your character will automatically succeed the saving throw. But this is a reaction and it must be used before the saving throw is rolled by the DM or the player. Now the good news here for you is, in addition to that, if your attack hits and does some damage or is triggering some other form of effect, then both the damage and or the effects would come into play. So let's say, for example, one of your attacks knocks an individual prone. Well, if that's because of a weapon attack or a spell, then yes, it, that effect would still come into play. However, if, for instance, the effect was that you do additional damage, say an additional 1d6 points of damage, because you haven't yet used that feature yet this round, then this would be an opportunity for you to apply that extra damage. Now, this isn't one that is required to be added to your character's action sheet, and the reason for that is because you're telling the Dungeon Master, I'm going to be using my reaction at this point 
to counter that required saving throw and make an attack roll. If I hit, blah, 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 blah. That's exactly how this particular scenario will go. The only thing that you might have to do is link this particular feature into the chat log so that the... Apparently, I don't own that one. Yeah, it, it will because I've opened this directly. I didn't open this there. So that's the reason why. So you'll notice I opened this directly from this sheet, whereas in relation to our character's ability sheet, it's listed here. So I just have to drag and drop it there. But in any event, that will give the dungeon master the information they need to determine what has to happen before or after the roll, all that jazz. Now, the final thing that we have to do is deal with the spell we gain at level 17. So I'm going to just simply drag and drop this into place. Scroll down, confirm that it has been created with our appropriate level and spell group here. And then I'm going to ensure that it is prepared so that we know that it's ready for use. And as I stated earlier, none of these spells count against your prepared spells list. So this means that these never become unprepared. And they don't even have to theoretically be prepared. But we do that just as a precaution, just so that you know that they're going to show up whenever you switch into a combat mode. And as long as you have active spell slots, these spells will be available. So, for example, you see this 5th level category here, that will go away once I've used all my spell slots for 5th level. Same with that 4th level. Oops. There we go. So on and so forth. And that really brings us to the end of the setup of this particular character. And I'm currently using this character in a campaign, and so far I'm thoroughly enjoying the class as it scratches my ranger itch at the same time as trying something different within the ranger set of subclasses, if you will. I definitely recommend that someone gives this particular subclass a try. And while I'm having fun with it, my character's still low level, even though I'm still packing quite a punch with this particular character. I just wish the dice would roll my way a little bit more, but doesn't every player? However, this does bring us to the end of this video. I hope you found it useful and informative, and I look forward to seeing you in the next one. I wish to thank you for taking the time to watch this particular video. I hope you found it informative and useful to familiarizing yourself with Fantasy Grounds in general and that you had fun in the process. If you found the video useful and you liked the content of the particular video, go ahead and click that like button to let me know. And if you have any questions specific to the topic covered by this particular video or just have some comments in general, please feel free to post something in the comments section. I'll do my best to respond to any questions that are asked. Additionally, I do release content quite regularly, and it's generally specific to Fantasy Grounds or 5th edition Dungeons & Dragons at this time. So if you'd like to be notified when new videos come out, go ahead and subscribe and click the notification bell to ensure that notification is sent to you when I release a new video.